Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Jan, for stepping in last minute. Uh, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks uh, that we can meet together uh, today. We thank you that we are your people gathered, even though not physically present with each other. But meeting together in this way, we show our unity uh, in Christ, uh, our fellowship uh, in you. And uh, uh, we pray, Lord, that as we look at your word, as we consider it, uh, we pray that you might speak to us. Uh, please uh, uh, sharpen our minds that we might uh, uh, hear and, uh, and digest your word. Uh, please uh, impress it upon our hearts so that we might be inclined to uh, uh, live the way you would have us live. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to encourage you always um, as we meet together, whether it's uh, in person or online, to uh, uh, have the scriptures uh, open uh, as, we, uh, as we come to God's word, whether it's a, a physical Bible or a Bible on your phone or iPad, however it might be. Um, it's uh, good that uh, if you are uh, following along as we look at God's word together. Um, but let me ask you, what is your mission in life? What is your purpose, your reason for being? Uh, many companies, many organisations will have a, a mission statement. It helps guide them by defining who they are and uh, why they do what they do. Uh, McDonald's, for example, has a mission statement. It is to be our customers' favourite place and way to eat and drink. Uh, our church has a mission statement. Do you know what it is? It is to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, and loving one another. Uh, mission statements are important because they help to clarify for us what we are supposed to be on about, uh, what our, our focus is to be about. Because uh, it's very easy to get distracted. It's very easy to become focused on the urgent rather than the important. And it feels good to get things done, to tick off the, the to-do list. The payoff is immediate. But without an overarching purpose or, or mission statement, you might not fulfill any long-term goals. Uh, and that's the reason why some people even have a personal mission statement. Have you ever thought about that, having a, a personal uh, mission statement? I think most of us uh, have an idea of uh, why we're here and what we're doing, but to actually articulate it uh, in a phrase. Uh, Stephen R. Covey, who wrote the, the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People in 1989, suggests that individuals should create their own personal mission statement because it provides clarity and gives us a, a sense of purpose. It defines who we are and how we'll live. Uh, Oprah Winfrey has a personal mission statement. Hers is to be a teacher and to be known for inspiring her students to be more than they thought they could be. Uh, Sir Richard Branson, uh, he's the one that just sent us, one of the guys who sent a spaceship up into, into space. His personal mission statement is to have fun in my journey through life and learn from my mistakes. Uh, Naomi Simpson, the founder of Red Balloon, her personal mission statement is live what you love. Now, as we come to the beginning of uh, Jesus's public ministry, we actually uh, see his personal mission, his purpose, his, his reason for being, his reason for coming. Uh, and we heard it last week, Jesus was in the synagogue, he gets up and he reads from Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Uh, and Luke says, Jesus rolled up the Isaiah scroll, gave it back to the attendant and said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, I'm the one, it's me, I'm your Messiah, this is my mission. And so as we get into it, what does Jesus's mission look like? 
Well, first and foremost, I think Jesus's mission is a word mission. It's a teaching, preaching and proclaiming mission uh, to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Uh, and Jesus is saying that his coming initiates the year of the Lord's favour. And we heard last week that the year of the Lord's favour is a, a reference to the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee had a particular focus on the ownership and management of the land in Israel. According to Leviticus, Hebrew slaves and prisoners would be set free, debts would be cancelled, land which had been confiscated to pay debts would be returned to its original owner. It was the year when the mercies of Yahweh would be particularly manifest. So Jesus is saying he is the one through whom the mercies of Yahweh are made manifest. Jesus inaugurates the season of God's gracious blessing on his people. Uh, so where the year of Jubilee in the Old Testament was about really about economic reset, Jesus' coming inaugurates a time of spiritual reset. So that's the background. What, but what do we first see Jesus do after he leaves Nazareth to go down to Capernaum? Well, if we look at verse 31, it says, then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath, he taught the people. What's the first thing we see Jesus do? Teach. Jesus's mission, first and foremost, is a word mission. And we'll see numerous examples of this as we work through the gospel. Christianity at its heart is a word faith. Uh, Jesus himself is referred to as the word. I'm thinking John 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So it shouldn't be that surprising that when the word should come, he should come with a word mission. And Jesus's miracles were often performed with words accompanying them. Verses 38, 39, it says, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. So she got up at once and began to wait on them. What does Jesus do? He rebukes the fever. He uses his words, which seems like a really strange thing to do for a fever. Uh, you and I, we take Panadol, but the one who is Lord over creation speaks to the fever sternly and it leaves. Likewise, he commands evil spirits to leave with his words. Verse 35, be quiet, Jesus said sternly, come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. Because Jesus's mission is a word mission, I think it's one of the reasons why we have to be so careful uh, with the word. Uh, Remember from our series on 2 Timothy, Paul says uh, to Timothy, keep reminding God's people of these things. That would be that the gospel, the content of the gospel. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It's of no value and only ruins those who listen. And then he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. The writer to the Hebrews refers to the word, the gospel, as a sword. Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the gospel has both the power to save, but also to condemn. And that's why it's so important that we are careful with the word. I love what Spurgeon said about this. Uh, and I'll, I want to read you a quote. It's a fairly lengthy quote, so hang in there. Uh, but I think it's worth it. Spurgeon said, 
what is the right way then to handle the word of truth? It is like a sword and it was not meant to be played with. Uh, that is not rightly to handle the gospel. It must be used in earnest and pushed home. Are you converted, my friends? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Are you saved or not? Swords are meant to cut and hack and wound and kill with. And the word of truth is for pricking men in the heart and killing their sins. The word of God is not committed to God's ministers to amuse men with its glitter, nor to charm them with the jewels in its hilt, but to conquer their souls for Jesus. Remember, dear hearers, if the preacher does not push you to this, that you shall be converted, or he will know the reason why. If he does not drive you to this, that you shall either willfully reject or cheerfully accept Christ, he has not yet known how rightly to handle the great sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Well, there's certainly a challenge and a half. Uh, Jesus's mission is, is primarily a word mission, but Jesus's mission is also a mission with authority. Look with me at verse 31. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. What does it mean that Jesus's words had authority? Well, let me give you some background. In Jesus's day, the the experts in Old Testament law were the scribes. And so respected were they, the people considered their interpretations as binding. The scribes were also the ones who held the seats of honor in the synagogues. Often the scribes were civil lawyers as well. And so they occupied an important place in first century Jewish society. Only a scribe, could sit on the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Jews. The scribes taught by citing the opinions of various rabbis on different matters, appealing not to their own authority, but to the authority of others. Jesus, on the other hand, didn't appeal to the authority of the rabbis when he taught. Instead, as the Bible commentator Matthew Henry comments, Jesus taught as one that knew the mind of God and was commissioned to declare it. And Jesus often backed up his teaching with signs of his power and authority. And you see this clearly in the account of Jesus healing the paralyzed man in chapter 5, verse 22. Uh, Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. John West will preach on that passage next week. So I don't want to go too much into it. Let me just say, Jesus backs up his words. He doesn't just talk the talk. He walks the walk and in so doing demonstrates that his mission carries with it the authority of God to forgive sins. Are you a man or a woman who walks the walk or just talks the talk? We need to ensure that we are people who, who walk the walk as well as talk the talk, that we back up what we say by our actions, which is hard to do on, because as I've said before, on some level, we're all hypocrites. We are all sinners saved by the blood of Christ shed on the cross. But the world is always looking for us to slip up, looking for opportunities to point the finger. But thank goodness we don't appeal to our own authority, but to the authority of Christ, who never slips up. Thirdly, Jesus' mission is a mission with power. In verses 31 to 36, Jesus drives out a demon, an impure spirit, and Jesus dominates the demon by ordering it to be quiet. The demon has no choice but to obey. There's no sense in the scriptures of Jesus engaged in a struggle with the demonic. 
it, it's not like as Jesus encounters a demon that it could go either way. It's a little bit like how the Rabbitohs completely dominated the Sea Eagles on Friday night. It was no contest. When Jesus encounters evil spirits, it's no contest. He deals with them swiftly. They come out at his command. And the people recognize it. Verse 36, all the people were amazed and said to each other, what words these are. With authority and power, he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out. Jesus' authority and power, it's so great. It extends even to the hidden world and rules the cosmic forces. He has the power to free a person from the evil forces that affect life. Jesus was no mere moralist, nor was he merely a great motivator or, or, or psychologist. This was teaching in action, an illustration of his power. Jesus is the one with the power to defeat the evil forces arraigned against humanity. And Jesus will eventually uh, demonstrate his ultimate uh, power and authority when he goes to the cross and dies for the sin of the whole world and takes up his life again. Jesus will conquer death and with it he will conquer sin. And that's the ultimate miracle the ultimate authority and power. But Jesus's mission was, it was also focused on the important, not the urgent. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but as I read the, the, uh, the gospel accounts, Jesus can come across as a little bit insensitive to the needs of the people around him. Say, for example, uh, someone is dying. We know the story, yet he doesn't rush to help them. Uh, and there's a reason for that. People clamor after him, but he moves on to the next town. We see that at the end of chapter four, verse 42. It says at daybreak, day break, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. Uh, well, clearly there's more work that needs to be done where Jesus was in Capernaum, uh, more people to heal, more people uh, to, to reach with uh, uh, his word, but Jesus chooses to move on. It, it's not that he doesn't have compassion, but I think he's saying there will always be more people to heal, more demons to cast out. But Jesus's primary focus is on the important not the urgent. He mustn't get sidetracked from his primary pur pur purpose, which we see in verse 43. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because this is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. I know uh, at times I can struggle in, in my role with balancing the the important with the urgent. It's really easy to get sidetracked by uh, some pressing need, whether it's uh, people suffering, going through hard times, um, uh, the, the last minute things that, that, that crop up. Um, and often then planning for the future, setting big goals can uh, often get relegated to the, the back seat because the, the urgent takes over the important. And I'm constantly having to bring myself back to think, hang on, I need to be thinking long term. Uh, Jesus was firmly fixed on why he came. His ultimate destiny was Jerusalem and a cross. Nothing would sidetrack him from that. I feel like that we as uh, the, the church, um, whether it's our church or the church in general, has been sidetracked in some ways. I feel our diocese has been sidetracked and has lost sight of the, the main thing. We need to keep the main thing, the main thing. And it's really important to, that we get this right. Uh, Jesus' mission finally reveals his identity. Of course, only the son of God, the one sent by God, God himself, 
could have a mission such as this. But what I find really interesting is how people respond to Jesus's mission. In verse 28, remember the people of Nazareth who knew Jesus as a boy who watched him grow up, all of a sudden they want to throw him off a cliff. Verse 36, others were amazed. I think it's more a case of incredulity. They really didn't understand or couldn't make sense of what they were seeing or hearing. But who are the ones who actually recognize Jesus for who he is and why he came? Look with me at verse 33. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, go away. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And then in verse 41, Luke says that demons came out of many people shouting, you are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and wouldn't allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. Who are the ones that recognized Jesus for who he is? It was the demons who unmistakably recognized Jesus for who he was. And because of this, Jesus wanted to retain control of how and when he would reveal his purposes for coming. He didn't want the demons outing him before he was ready. And so he went from town to town, village to village, continuing to reveal his purpose, demonstrating his power and authority, the power and authority that is essential to his identity and allows him to lay claim to every person's devotion and commitment, including yours and mine. And eventually Jesus will do the work of the Messiah, the Saviour, when he lays down his life for the sins of all who put their trust in him. Jesus brought his power and authority to us in order to undo the damage that sin had done to his creation. Every sickness he healed, every demon he cast out, every person he raised from the dead was a reversal of the curse of sin. Every healing was a sign that pointed forward to the ultimate healing that Jesus would work for us. The ultimate eternal healing that Jesus worked for us happened on that cross. On that cross, as Jesus suffered the final eternal consequence of our sin, he endured the full punishment of sin for us. He endured the full wrath of God in our place. He satisfied the just judgment of God against our sin, as God had promised through his prophet Isaiah. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The healing that Jesus gives to us was authenticated by his resurrection from the dead. Through his resurrection, we have the promise that all his work, his perfect life and his perfect sacrifice on the cross, all his work is for us. And he promises that we shall rise just as he rose. He promises we shall live with him in heaven forever. And what's behind these promises? It's the power and authority of his word. The same word that created the universe out of nothing. The same word that continues to sustain and keep all things in existence. The very word which became flesh for us. That holy word revealed himself in Capernaum with power and authority. And by that same powerful word, Jesus joins us to himself in his life, in his suffering, and in his death and resurrection. Christ's word is powerful. It's what we need for life and salvation. 
It does what it says. So don't be ashamed of it. Don't let it gather dust during the week. Christ's word has power and authority, the power and authority to rebuke demons, the power and authority to rebuke fevers, the power and authority to save your soul and my soul. Amen.